first of all, our chair, Kate, Kate Parry, is um, also uh, the leader of the Cumbria Museums Consortium, which, it, which she'll tell you a bit more about, which is one of the big organisations in Cumbria that's benefited from our Arts Council money um, planning for the next three years. So Kate's just going to take 15 minutes to talk about that, talk, explain it all, and also thinking about the repercussions, positive repercussions for the county as well. So um, Kate, I've got a couple of slides for you here as well, but over to you. Okay. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, this time last week, um, I was um, trying frantically to get my laptop to work and to be able to access the um, decisions that the Arts Council had just put up onto their website. And um, my laptop packed up and I was completely beside myself, but I um, got there in the end and it was, it was good news for Cumbria Museum Consortium. But we will talk more about that now. So first of all, first slide then, Tom. So it has been a big week uh, for the culture sector, for the arts sector as a whole. We're just going to look at um, the sort of big picture briefly and then focus in on Cumbria a little bit. You just unmute, Tom. I'll just keep Bear going. Bear with me. I'm just going to share again because it didn't share for me. Here we go again. That's fine. I'm a, I'm a pro. I'll just carry on. First of all, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood what we mean by NPO. Um, so an NPO is a national portfolio organisation. And when we, you've heard a lot about NPO decisions this week, that, that basically means the decision by the Arts Council to fund an organisation for uh, regularly for the next three years. So that's what NPO funding is. An NPO organisation is an organisation that is part of the National Portfolio Arts Council's regularly funded organisations. OK, next. So first of all, the big picture, then. the Arts Council have just announced that they are funding 990 organisations over the next three years nationally. That's a, quite a big jump on uh, previous investment rounds. That includes 40 organisations, which are called IPSOs, Investment Principal Support Organisations. In other words, those organisations who will help the sector to deliver on the investment principles that are central to the Arts, Arts Council's strategy, Let's Create. So if, effectively, they are what was sector support organisations. There are 276 New organisations added to the portfolio this time, and the total uh, amount invested is there, 446 million. Of that, a big chunk of money has gone into uh, funding organisations that are in levelling up for culture places. In other words, those places that the Arts Council has identified as having particularly low engagement in the arts. So you will have heard a lot of, about that Lately, it's been quite controversial because obviously where new organisations are funded, some organisations have had their funding withdrawn. So it hasn't been an easy week at all, although there have been some, some, really, <clears throat> some really good news. There's also been a lot of bad news. And, you know, the ripple effects for those organisations of those organisations not being funded um, is, is significant. On Tuesday night, I was at a Cockermouth Music Society concert with the Hafner Wind Quintet, and I didn't know till after they'd finished playing that they're all um, principal wind players in the Britain Sinfonia Orchestra, which had just had their funding chopped completely. So it, it, for, some, for a lot of people, it's been a very distressing week, and uh, I think there will continue to be a lot of debate and discussion about whether it's right that those organisations were cut, were cut, but I guess somebody had to make some extremely tough decisions. All right, next then. So in Cumbria, the Arts Council has committed to spending £3,846,257 there for the next for each of the next three years. So that's the total annual funding across Cumbria. There are now 13 NPO organisations, and that equates to 16 organisations being supported. 
And the difference between those two figures is that some organisations um, or some applications were made by consortia. So my day job is to manage Cumbria Museum Consortium. So we're one NPO, but it's three organisations, Lakeland Arts, Trolley House Museum and Wordsworth Grasmere. The other consortia is um, Highlights Rural Touring, who go in funding with Arts Out West, the rural touring scheme for uh, the west of Cumbria. So there are 16 organisations now supported, and the great news is that there is one new addition in Cumbria, and that is Signal Film and Media in Barrow. So enormous congratulations to them. I think it's hugely well deserved. Um, they're a brilliant organisation that do tremendous stuff, and it's long overdue. So um, what I can't tell you is which organisations were not funded, but I, it, it's that's the case nationally, apart from the ones that you hear about and the sort of a, there's a lot of noise about, it's very difficult to tell which organisations um, were not successful. Yeah, but it's great for Signal, I agree, and they are brilliant. OK, next uh, slide then. So just a little bit more detail about Cumbria. When you look at the figures, as I've been doing over the course of this week, there is overall a 20% increase in funding coming to um, Cum uh, Cumbria yeah, as a county. The totals coming are uh, to Westmoreland and Furness, uh, as it says there, to, uh, 2,602,000, and in Cumberland is 1,244,000. Um, there are quite a lot more NPOs in Westmoreland and Furness, um, as it's worked out, than in Cumberland, so that's why there's a big difference. But the, the, the difference is also um, emerging because I think all of the Barrow NPOs and Rose Hill Theatre and Highlights Rural Touring received uplifts in their funding, which is terrific news, really well deserved in every single case. And in a moment, we'll perhaps hear from Deanne a little bit about Rose Hill in particular. Um, so, yeah, that's why there is a... Um, an uplift, but there's also a, a, a difference. It doesn't sort of divide neatly between Westmoreland, Furness and Cumberland. So apart from those organisations li listed there, all the other NPOs remain at a standstill funding position. Um, that means that they're not getting any more than they have had last year. And what they had last year was not very much more at all from what they were getting 10 years ago. So it's something like a 40% cut over the last 10, 10 years. So what happens now is that um, those organisations work with the Arts Council to establish exactly what they can deliver for the money that they have been awarded. And that's called the negotiation process. And that's what will happen now and will go on until January because you can't just carry on delivering the same amount on less and less money. But the good thing is that there is no one, no organisations in Cumbria had their funding chopped completely. So it's a mixed picture. There's some really good news and there was a lot of cause for celebration last Friday, but obviously um, it's a difficult operating context and there were a lot of organisations nationally who either lost out completely or saw funding reduced and even a small reduction at the moment is difficult to cope with. Um, so I just wanted to finish by saying why I think that this matters for the sector as a whole. Um, it, if you don't work for an NPO and you have nothing to do with NPOs, it's very easy to say, well, they are mopping up all this money. How, how is that fair? It is really important to understand the breadth and extent of work that national portfolio organisations do in reaching out to the nooks and crannies of the most underserved communities in terms of access to culture. And I can't stress enough how much goes on across Cumbria by those organisations. The other thing to say is that NPOs make the case for culture because they, they, are, they, are, they are empowered to do that. So it benefits the sector as a whole. And they also commission artists and freelancers uh, on a regular basis. So there is a sort of ecology that has NPOs at the centre of it. 
we'll, we'll hear more about it in just a moment, but those are my thoughts uh, on the week and the situation in Cumbria. Okay, do you want to just go to the final slide, which I think has got a list of all the names? Yeah, yeah, for information, these are the, uh, the NPO funded organisations in Cumbria for the next three years. Okay, so I am just going to go now. Um, can somebody tell me, has Rachel Ashton arrived? Amy, can you tell um, me? I can't see her. As no, yet. no problem. Let We're going to go to Dion yeah. then. Can you just close the presentation, Tom? Thank you very much. Uh, Dion. Diane is the um, executive director of Rose Hill Theatre in um, Whitehaven. Can you just tell us, Diane, what funding you were given and what it's for, first of all? Yep, so we have been granted just over 208,000 a year, um, which is a 229% increase on our previous funding, which was 63,000. So. Um, absolutely amazing, wonderful, overjoyed, shocked, um, all of the above, to be honest. Uh, but a, a lot of people have said, um, including ourselves, obviously, that it's been a long time coming. We've been woefully underfunded. We've been for a long time punching above our weight. Um, and the, the area itself has been kind of long under-supported, under-recognised, underfunded. So it's we don't see it as just for Rose Hill. We see it as kind of the Copeland area as well. It's um, we've been doing a lot of the work we're going to do. There's not actually a lot that we're going to do that's new. It's just that over the years we've been delivering it through supported grants from other people as well. So we've had to kind of back up uh, the little bit that we've had from Arts Council by getting a lot of project specific grants, little pockets of 10, 15, 20,000 here and there. So it's it's been tough, it's been hard work, and it's just wonderful that Arts Council kind of recognise the level of the work we're doing. And it's predominantly recognising our change in vision, particularly as we came out of COVID, very much more getting out into the community. It's like you said, Kate, very much to the nuts and bolts. Um, we're kind of, we've developed stronger connected communities already. Um, we're doing a lot more collaboration um, with partners, both in the sector and outside the sector. So we're doing a lot around social prescribing. Uh, the creative wellness has just gone huge the last 18 months, which is both amazing and actually quite sort of sobering that there's that much need for it out there. Uh, we've been collaborating with communities to improve access um, strong emphasis on families. Um, and like you say, just creating, well, safeguarding firstly and creating a lot of jobs within the sector, a lot of freelance practitioners and then everybody in that supply chain as well. So it's really important to us um, and, you know, being able to put on things like free festivals. You know, we haven't really done that an awful lot before and we touched on it a couple of times in the last year. Um, and it's just wonderful to get out there and people seem really appreciative. And, you know, we're just conscious that access has changed a lot over time. Um, so we just can get out to people a lot more. So we're really trying to trumpet the fact that we are actually Rose Hill Arts Trust, not just Rose Hill Theatre. And while our on-stage programme is incredibly support um, important, there's so much more than that that we're going to deliver as well. OK, and so that's really helpful. Thank you, Deanna. It is such good news um, and very long overdue. I agree. What do you think? What, what do you think um, funding for NPOs means for the Cumbrian culture sector as a whole? Then what would you say? I think it's it really helps kind of knit, knit the sector together, almost kind of helps contribute to an area's cultural identity. Um, I mean, from from simple practical points of view, there's nowhere else we will get two hundred eight thousand pounds of unrestricted funding. So basically, just to contribute to the costs of our staff, our building, our getting out and about, being able to support a lot of uh, creative practitioners, a lot of freelancers within the sector. Most of the funds we've had in the past have been very much around say £10,000 to deliver a project, £8,000 of that might be about the actual delivery, the materials, et cetera. £2,000 of that might contribute to core wages. Um, with the size of the organisation we have, it takes a lot to cover core costs. So 
it is hugely important. But I say, I, I, you know, more important than that, it is about, I think, um, knitting together that kind of county cultural identity. Yeah. Um, OK, is there anything else you want to just say, Deanne, about the, this week and what it's been like? Well, I, I was going to say, I mean, it, it's funny you were saying, Kate, about, you know, with people who aren't in it, who might look at it and go, gosh, um, there is also the recognition for those of us who are in it. It can be a poison chalice being in the Arts Council MPO. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not saying that we don't want the money, um, but a lot of people do see it a bit akin to kind of selling your soul to the devil. Uh, there's a lot of work. It's not easy. It doesn't come without its challenges and its huge strings. Um, there's a heck of a lot of paperwork and reporting. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's a hugely tough process. I mean, the process that we went through to get to this stage in the first place was in one word horrendous um yeah. and it, as you've said it's not over yet so we've now still got to kind of revisit what we submitted we're effectively resubmitting our application all over again with a nod to kind of how the world's changed since the six months that we submitted it the last time um so it's it's still going to be hard work there it's also it's tough when it's a very small organization that and most of us are in this county yeah. that you're having to do all of that yourself and you don't have the support there and you've still got the day job to do as well so yeah. you know while it's amazingly positive it's not all fantastic and we are working yeah. hard to do what we yeah. have to it is it is quite brutal I'll vouch for that having done it many times now but you know I've also run a tiny organization I run the Kergate in, in Cockermouth for a long time on no regular funding and that's brutal in a different way so you know nobody it's none of it's easy let's face it and I have the greatest sympathy and empathy for those people who are sitting here saying well you know what could we do with 200 grand a year okay uh, any questions then and thank you to Deanne for, for that perspective or comments in fact <laughs> from anybody well i think that 21 percent increase for cumbria is a remarkable figure uh you know i think that's that's just to be let's let's celebrate the, the high points you know um we can go we can there's another conversation about whether it's fair and i noticed that derek's put there cannot escape the feeling that sometimes arts council judgments seem arbitrary but the bottom line is 21 percent more money is coming into cumbria um on this yeah. on this period of time um and that's that's to be celebrated andrew deakin did you want to chip in and then um, there's joe at uh out gene i'll come to you in a sec joe yeah i mean yeah because it i mean i uh, i would um repeat what what leon has said um it's it's i wouldn't call it a poison chalice i just call it a, a whole set of challenges that unless you're dealing with them you don't know about them um and you know we've had some reporting in the local newspaper which seems to suggest that you know um Fawn is getting 170,000 a year um and somehow that's going into my back pocket um and Glenn of course he can have a few quid but and the the perception of where how that money is spent is 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 very skewed and and you know to be honest some of that is to do with the way we present ourselves where we're not we're, we're not clear about how money is spent um so that we had a, we had sort of mixed emotions on on um friday um glenn was expecting us to get nothing <laughs> I was expecting us to get what we got. Um, I'm a born optimist. Um, I was convinced Signal would get their money. I mean, you know, if, if Signal didn't get an MPO this time around, then the, the world's gone completely nuts. Um, so, um, but on Friday morning, um, I came to the meeting, as you saw, um, partly because I didn't know what the result was because Glenn had gone to a music lesson um, at, for 9.30, so <laughs> we didn't know. Um and this sort of mixed emotions, because like you say, um, Kate, you only know those people who didn't get funded if you're on the the, the um, grapevine and yeah. you hear about them. I mean, the Britain Symphonia, um, 
it's, it's, it's just makes you wonder how those decisions are made. But they're incredibly oh. difficult decisions to make. You know, if you're sat there with that pot of money at Arts Council and you're having to fulfil um, all these uh, requirements, even though they're meant to be an arm's length or, uh, organisation, I think the days of arm's length organisations have, have more or less gone. So they've got all sorts of political imperatives that they have yeah. to deal with. Andrew, I'm just going to go to 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 Joe at Archie because we have to shift on in a second. Yeah, no, it's fine. Anyway, it's, it's grandly good news for for Cumbria. We just need to shout about it much more. Uh, absolutely, Joe. Oh, thank you. I just want to say thank you to uh, the network for for putting a spotlight on this. Um, well, we had no mixed emotions on Friday in Archie. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been really fascinated by how many I've been following the the tweets of you know um, uh, people. Uh, celebrating and not the announcements and uh, I've been really fascinated by how many organizations have been saying how grateful they are to the Arts Council. Uh, at Archie we're not in the least bit grateful, we're just um, <laughs> very, um, uh, you know, very pleased uh, that they've recognized um, the, the uh, 20 years of underfunding um, to this part of the northwest of England uh, and, have, and have started to write that in, in some way. Uh, just on a personal note, it was my, I'm, you may may or may not know I'm the fundraiser for uh, Art Gene, so uh, there's nowhere to hide on a on a day like like last Friday. Um, it's a very stressful place to be. Um, it was my first Arts Council application, so I'm uh, kind of doubly pleased that we've yeah. um, increased our um, regular funding year on year. And uh, yeah, it goes without saying that we will uh, spend extremely wisely on. Yeah art and art alone, uh, except I just want to make the point for those who are skeptical that um, arts organizations, as well as delivering art, um, often um, protect the fabric um, of our societies. And in our case, you know, we occupy an enormous listed building um, that would have probably, you know, little other use to another kind of organization. Um, it's a very, very difficult building to occupy. It's uncomfortable. Uh, it's currently leaking. It's always freezing. Um, but we keep it alive and we keep it safe. And if you've been to Barrow lately, uh, that can't be said for several of our other historic buildings. So I, I just always make that point. It's partly because I you know, used to work for the Heritage Lottery Fund and I care about this stuff. Um, it's a good point, Joe. but we, we're going to have to shift yeah. on. Thank you. Sorry, apologies. No, no, not at all. Thank you very much for coming and chipping in. It's really appreciated. So, yeah, mixed emotions and a, and a complicated picture. But we, we, you know, we've got to be pleased with the result from last Friday. So, yeah, I think that's the conclusion. Thanks, everybody. Tom. Thank you, Kate. Well, let's go to Liverpool now where it's calm. I am told. And let's hear from Safina Aziz, uh, who's joining the call uh, for the first time. Safina is the Director of Inclusion at Curious Minds, which is a charity that works to ensure all children and young people, regardless of background, have access to great arts and culture, both in and out of education. Safina was originally going to join us at Rose Hill all those weeks ago. Seems like a lifetime ago now. Hello. Um, but was hit was struck down by COVID. I hope you don't mind me revealing that, Safina. Um, uh, you're looking much better this morning. So the floor is yours. It's private information, Tom. <laughs> the floor is yours um, to tell us a bit more about what you do, the impact in Cumbria as well, and I guess something about why inclusivity is obviously a passion of yours as well. So over to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I feel really not qualified in lots for lots of reasons, mainly because I don't live there, and uh, to to overly comment on uh, on the arts scene in Cumbria. But what I think is is like we're as Maya Angelou said, you know, we're, we're more alike than we are different, and uh, and I think um, uh, it, I think the problems that we all have and the lovely things that we all have are probably very much the same. So, and also I'm not I'm a woman uh, who isn't without opinion, so I'm sure that will not stop me commenting on uh, the work that you all do. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's an absolute um, privilege to be um, in a hive mind situation with uh, people who are doing brilliant work and want to continue and improve. Um, now I can sit here and talk to you about Curious Minds and the work that we do, um, which, is, which is interesting, but I just thought that I'll 
tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, Tom said to me, you know, keep it to about 15, 20 minutes, which I will do. I'm very good in terms of timekeeping. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. I'm a writer. Um, I have a play on next year in theatre and, and some other things in development. And so I think sometimes the best way for me to talk about the work that I do is to, is to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, and I think that obviously there will be differences, but I, I think some of this might resonate with, with a lot of you here. So, um, and hopefully nobody thinks, oh, for God's sake, one bore off, will you? Um, so yeah, so uh, my name is Safina Aziz. Um, my parents are uh, not from England. Uh, they are definitely uh, informed by British Empire. And um, my dad's Indian and my mum is Guyanese from South America, also counted as part of the West Indies. And then they, uh, came to uh, England in the 60s and met in Liverpool, had five children, and I was the last, obviously the best, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and yeah, so that was those two met in Liverpool and, and had five children. Then they got divorced, and, um, and my mum was a single mother of five young people, young children, and we lived in Toxteth. Some of you may know the reason the name Toxeth because in the 80s there were riots there, as there were in a lot of places around the country, um, very much uh, around racism and police behavior, which sadly is still resonant today. Um, and we lived in a two up, two down. And um, I don't say that for any Dickensian reasons, but I'm again, I'm sure there's people this story will resonate with. And my mum worked in a biscuit factory. And um, my dad was an ice cream man. So we, you know, the fact that I still have my own teeth, albeit with braces, is an absolutely commendable to them. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, very working class uh, background. And uh, when I was about, I went to school, but the school didn't have art provision. It was a great school. I loved school. Um, I didn't do any studying. Uh, I was in the bottom stream for a lot of things. Um, and uh, but it didn't have any arts provision, but I had lots of friends and I, it was lovely. And um, so out of school, me and my best mate, Soraya, we were sitting in a burger bar one day and uh, it was like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I was like, you know what I want to really want to do? I really want to sing. So she was like, I want to sing too. So where can we go? So we were like, where can we go? Where is the... Anyway, in our in our uh, city, in, in Liverpool 8, which Toxas is also known as, there was a place called the Charles Wotton Centre. And the Charles Wotton Centre was a community centre um, in the heart of the black community. And it was filled with musicians and artists um, of all shapes and sizes and colours and ethnicities. And, um, and we went there and it was something like, I don't even remember, I think you had to pay like 50p or something to, to go in, you know, like the back in the day. Um, and and so I learned to kind of sing and do choral work and all of that lovely stuff in there. And I met one of my really good friends, uh, Jennifer John, who is a woman, a black woman of Afro-Caribbean who's from Trinidad. Um, and I say all of these things because it's relevant rather than me just plucking out random facts for no apparent reason. Um, and then when I was over, when I was 90, I think it was about 20, there was an initiative in Liverpool, and I tell you no lie, it was called Are You Black and Over 19? Right. I know, it kind of lacks a little bit of poetry, I feel. Um, and, <laughs> and back in the 80s, uh, black was used as a generic term. Was political, black was a very political term, so it included everybody who wasn't white. Um, so I remember we all rocked up for our interviews, um, and one of my friends said, if they ask me why, what my qualifications are to do this job, you know what I'm going to say? And I was like, what? And he went, I'm going to say I'm black and I'm over 19. And that was it. And what it was, was it was the arts organisations in Liverpool. So it was the Playhouse Theatre, the Philharmonic, the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. Um, and I'm trying to think a couple of other theatres. Um, oh, the Everyman as well, because the Everyman and Playhouse weren't joined at that time. And it was because the arts organizations, go figure, 
realized that they didn't have enough black or brown people in their organizations. This was in the 80s. <laughs> so uh, they decided to create this very clunky program called Are You Black and Overnight Team? And really interestingly, uh, it, it didn't go well, as you can imagine. As you can imagine, I um, carried an awful lot of boxes, I have to say, and um, it was a very strange existence. Uh, somebody else ended up actually having a fight with somebody like a physical fight with somebody um and which was which was not good the person who had the best um experience was a young black man who was a musician bass player drummer played a little bit of keyboards guitar drummers always play bass players always play drums don't they it's all the rhythm section and um and he was in the philharmonic now the philharmonic um you know, before Sheku Callum Mason, there was no, nobody knew any black classical musicians at all. Um, but he had an amazing time. And when he talked about it, it's because it was musicians talking to musicians and the musicians in the orchestra who were all white. He was teaching them like licks on the bass and how to kind of loosen up. And they were teaching him kind of some kind of discipline around notation stuff. And the, the Philharmonic didn't pretend to be anything that it wasn't. It knew that it had some issues. The other organizations pretended that they were at the fourth. They weren't the Philharmonic. They weren't the classical organizations. We are the grass. We, we're in the community and we love the community. But they actually fared the worst. And I always remember that. Um, how those organizations, how a classical organization, an all white organization was unafraid to say, we have a problem with the organizations that pretended that they didn't have a problem, have the problem. And there's a phrase which I use, which is like, they had the illusion of inclusion and they, they still did for a long time. Um, so then fast forward, don't worry, I'm not gonna tell you my whole, in case everyone's like, oh my God, is she 30 yet? <laughs> so anyway, um, then four of my, four, of, four young women, um, we all got together um, and Margaret Thatcher's legacy, which was Enterprise Allowance. I think he could, like, he got 25 quid a week or something, and you could sign on and all of that sort of stuff and get benefits. And um, the four of us got together. Now, two women of uh, Afro-Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago descent, um, Trinidad and Barbados descent, and myself, um, Indian heritage, and Juliet, who is white. And the four of us were friends. Um, and... We formed our own organization called Sense of Sound, which was anything and everything to do with singing. Um, and we, in the city of Liverpool, we were, we, because of the way we looked, <laughs> we were kind of like a walking diversity pool. We were also just happened to be a group of friends who decided to form their own company, art company together. Um, and so we would negotiate on each other's behalf because it was like, well, you negotiate terms and conditions for me. And, and we kind of felt form this rudimentary agency. Um, and uh, in the midst of this, I was, uh, uh, again, very opinionated and used to watch like films and because television was the thing that I grew up with. Um, and and I was watching a film one day and, and I was like, oh God, this is just so terrible. This is so terrible. And a friend of mine went to me, oh, for God's sakes, Phil, if you think you can do better, why don't you? So I was like, why don't I? Why don't I? Actually, like, why don't I? Now, I didn't know. This is ridiculous, right? In my 30s, I did not know you could go to university and do something like script writing, right? Because I didn't have a degree or I didn't have A-levels or anything like that. I had like two O-levels um, and, you know, kind of cobbled together some kind of, you know, career. Well, I call it career in inverted commas. Earn a money. And, um, and I went to Manchester University and, and Manchester University had a postgraduate diploma in writing for performance, but you had to have a degree. So I thought to myself, well, I haven't got a degree. I wonder if I could write to them and ask them, will they consider giving me a place? And what they did was they said, send us some pages of work and we will consider your application. So I did. And I got onto a postgraduate diploma course. 
yay me, <laughs> and yay them. Um, anyway, the postgraduate diploma course went a bit wrong, and everybody left except me, and there was four tutors. So the four tutors gathered me together in a room and said, we want to continue to teach you. How do you feel about continuing your this year, this final year? It was two years um, on your own, and we'll continue to teach you. So obviously I said, yeah, like, hello, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like a proper, proper masterclass. So anyway, I got that. And um, and that was my kind of writing. So writing was kind of bubbling away uh, uh, underneath those kind of like some kind of like noise that I was kind of quietly developing and quietly working. Um, and within Sense of Sound, uh, Sense of Sound came to an end in 2016, came to a natural end. Um, but just before we closed and decided to go our separate ways, still still really good friends, but you know, we're all hitting our late 40s, early 50s, and it's like, what do we want for the next part of our lives? Um, we got a commission by um, Liverpool International Music Festival by a young man called Yao Awusu, a young black man. Um, obviously he's brilliant because he commissioned us and um, I'm easily bought and, um, and we, I wrote a play and it was on the main stage at the Everyman Theatre. And uh, it was uh, a song with singing because we developed choirs. So we, we had our own choir that performed. Um, and we knew that we wanted to have somebody, a, a, a black person, a person of colour directing the play. So we asked Matthew Zia, um, who, uh, was an associate producer at the Everyman and is now living in London. I think he does um, uh, one of the touring uh, theatre companies down there. And he directed the play. So it was really important to us that it wasn't just black and brown people on the stages, but black and brown people were behind the scenes. Um, and so we, we did that. And we had a female lighting and sound technician, which again was really important to us as well. Um, so fast forward again, look at this, I'm up to 2019 already, aren't you lucky? Um, and a theatre company called Eclipse Theatre Company, which is a black theatre company, um, uh, was had set up a, an initiative called Slate. And um, Eclipse Theatre Company, I think is based in, I think it might be based in Leeds now. It was based London, Birmingham, I think. Um, uh, and it's, it was a black theatre company, and it, it's by the brilliant Dawn Walton, who was the director, and it um, created a programme called Slate, which was about sustained theatre up north. And I went for an interview for it, for the, and they created these posts, sorry, called Enablers, and it was all in the north, from, from Newcastle right through to Liverpool, Leeds, York, all kind of all those areas, about six or seven areas. And there's an enabler uh, job came up, which was to stay in your city and in Merseyside and uh, look for really interesting black and brown talents and support them, give them small pockets of funding, give them space to play, um, give them some money to go and see things, go, you know, go and travel and things like that. Um, and I went for an interview and I have to say, it was the worst interview, like, of my life. I'd never been interviewed because I'd, I'd always made my own work. So I'd never had an opportunity, like, so I was, here I am in my 40s, having my first interview for a job, and it was terrible. And I was on the train, and I was absolutely, like, smiling about it. I didn't even, it was so bad that I didn't feel bad about it. You know, when you kind of go, I know exactly that I'm not going to get that job. And lo and behold... <laughs> I didn't get the job. <laughs> so anyway, the Merseyside enabler that they um, recruited um, ended up leaving. So Dawn phoned the Unity Theatre and said, we need somebody on Merseyside um, for this job. Who have you got? And there's a woman who I knew called Louise Flukes who said there's only one person on Merseyside who I think could be perfect for this job. And her name is Safina Aziz. So Louise Fomey said, I've recommended you to work with 
eclipses their Merseyside enabler. And I was like, oh, I feel ashamed. So I told her the story about my terrible audition. Just don't remember who I am. You know, here I am, like, you know, the, the light shining on me. You know, she must remember. And it was awful. And she was showing... Ha, ha, Louise phoned Dawn and said, Fina says she gave a terrible interview and she just wants to say, look, she's really aware and blah, blah, blah. And, and Dawn was like, yeah, but that was like over a year ago, wasn't it? Hopefully she, she's grown as an artist. Anyway, so, so I got that job, um, which still afforded me a freelance life. Um, and then, so I got that job. And then in 20, January 2020, no word of a lie, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to launch a new business this year. That's going to be my big plan for 2020. Um, I'm going to launch a business. It's going to be about produce some work for other artists and it'll be great. Yeah, it'll be hard, but I've done a business before, blah, blah, blah. And then boom, <laughs> we all know what happened in 2020. Um, the world changed and on March the 16th, I think it was 16th for me, all of my work went away. Um, like no income, uh, thank goodness we have a welfare system um, uh, that saved my arse, frankly. I live in social housing, so my rent could be paid and all of that. Um, and and I remember a friend of mine said to me, can't you live on your savings? And I was like, like, what, what, what's that word you're saying? Um, so savings is like what you're talking about. and. Um, so then during 2020, I think what happened was a lot of organizations and people had the two things that artists need, which is time and space. And a lot of organizations started to reflect as a lot of people started to reflect. The pandemic was actually not bad for me. And what I mean about that is that when you're a freelancer, you've got to wake up the next day and just earn a living. You have to, there's no guaranteed salary. And so to be able to stop because there's no choice. It also gave me some time to think about what is it I want to do and what is it that I need and what is it I've got. Um, and I managed to, during that time, I wrote an application to the Arts Council for DYCP, Developing Your Creative Practice. And all of the Arts Council funding, as you know, was pulled off the table and they kind of turned it into emergency funds and all of this in 2020. But interestingly, a few organizations started to call me because obviously as the years had gone on, I'd acquired a little bit of a reputation and, you know, people knew who I was. They'd come to see my work because obviously I was a performer and a writer and, and all of that stuff. And um, so organizations were calling me Every Man Playhouse, uh, Curious Minds, um, Home in Manchester, and asking to have conversations around inclusion and diversity because what happened was coming back to this illusion of inclusion was that when the freelance community left these organizations they took diversity with them and some of these organizations ended up looking around and thinking oh who we're not as diverse as we thought we were because we saw people in our buildings that were but actually our staffing isn't what is going on and these are good people. I truly, truly believe that. These are good people who are operating in a really crazy system, but haven't, didn't have time to evaluate that system because they were busy in it and working in it. Um, and so Curious Minds set up an anti-racist group called the ARG. Curious Minds does amazing work, and I'll come and talk to you about that in a minute. Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse are now two th one theatre, but they're... Two theatres can join, but it's one company, uh, Everyman Playhouse. They set up a diversity action group. Um, home and like all lots of organisations across the country set up the Freelancers Network, which was to empower freelancers to talk about the work they do. I don't know what's going on with that at the moment. Um, and within the, uh, uh, within the Curious Minds ARG, the organization was looking at itself saying, we're an all white organization. <clears throat> and they got called out on social media because let's fa face it, not only did their champions have time and space on their hand, but their critics had time and space. And so they used that time and space and tweeted to them 
and said it's all very well saying you do good work but where are all the black people where your staff basically you're all white organization what's going on and Chris mine said actually that's that's true <laughs> there's no point you're right what can we do um so they did something about it now one of the things that they did was they got advice from an organization um and they started to develop their their strategy and the person who advised them said to them when to improve your staff pay somebody really well and also if you're going to bring somebody in that is going to diversify your your workforce you have to bring them in at a high level otherwise it's it's pointless you have to give somebody power really you have to put them in a powerful position and um, so they listened to that the problem was that people didn't leave curious minds very early so the, it was in a fortunate position where it had some money so it created a post called director of inclusion and a friend of mine nudged me and said to me I think you should go for that job so I was like what I can't go for that job and she's like why can't you go for that job so I said because a it's director it's like a highfalutin job the salary is not bad and um I can't I can't do that you know I, no 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 so she said you can and you're gonna go for it so I did and and I got the job which was fantastic and so here I am in my 50s, <laughs> it's the first proper job I've ever had in my life, which is brilliant. Um, and uh, what does it afford me? Um, it affords me the opportunity to change something in an organisation because it's quite a powerful position. And it's really interesting when you come from a work and class, class background, because even now, I'm not sure what that power means because I'm kind of still kind of getting acclimatized to it. And it was really interesting. I I had a meeting with the wonderful uh, Lizzie Crump, who some of you may know uh, from CLA, used to be um, uh, part of the Cultural Learning Alliance. And I was talking to her and she was kind of informally mentoring me because I met her. I thought she's really impressive and lovely. I'm going to talk to her and see if I can have a meeting with her. And, and then we had another meeting and we were just like having a cup of tea and, and just chatting. Um, and and I remember she said to me the other week, and I had a problem. She said, well, you are a director, aren't you? So I said, yeah. And she says, so you can change some things. And I was like, oh, yeah. You know what? I need to own this whole director job description thing. You know, it's like I need to print that job description off and the job title off and, and, and carry it around with me. And so it's really, really fascinating that, that, that I think when you're working class, when you're a woman, when you're a brown woman, all of those things contribute to a lack of confidence, even a lack of confidence for going for a job. Um, so what Sabina, I've done with Sabina, it, I put, yes. I put, I'm just going to cut across you because we've got about three minutes left. Oh, sorry, darling. Here. I've just gone on and on and on and on and on. That's all right. If, you, sorry, just, if I can ask you a question, as far as yeah. inclusivity um, yeah. in Cumbria is concerned, and obviously your patch covers Cumbria. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm just going to reiterate, we've got sort of two minutes, three minutes left on this one. Yeah. You know, in a nutshell, what are the challenges um, that you think we ought to we ought to be working on with people like you yeah. to make Cumbria a more inclusive place for arts well, and this culture? Is, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry that I kind of went on, but I just think context is really important because I think that's that all the people that we're trying to help are are people like ourselves, like me. And I think one of the things that we need to do is that we need to make people, we need to make render the visible, the invisible visible. We need to, we need role models. We need mentors. If you can see my journey, um, you'll see that I didn't do it alone. What's really interesting, just to share with you something, I saw just as I was coming online, I went onto Instagram because I had a couple of minutes. So I thought, I'll just have a little scroll. And there's who somebody I really like and respect is Emma Thompson. And um, em, Emma Thompson's post, it was, I'm not a trained actor. What I have is I have empathy, right? Now I'm sure Emma Thompson has absolutely innate skills like we all do. But when you dig down into Emma Thompson's biography, her, her mom is an actor, her dad created and wrote Magic Roundabout. She got a scholarship to Cambridge and she was the first woman in Cambridge Footlights with uh, Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. 
She went on to win Oscars. To negate how much your networks and your social capital means in your development, I, I think is wrong. And I think what happens is people like us need to share our stories of how we got to the positions that we got and not to devalue the role that the people that we know and the people that we've met along the way, how much luck has played a part, that it's not a meritocracy and we need to stop treating it like that. I would say we have to create spaces for people to do R&D, for people to play, really importantly for people to fail. Like I think that um, we, should, we need to judge people on the same, uh, on a different measure, not on the same measure, because it's not fair. You can't exclude people from practices and knowledge and then, then when they come through the door, expect that they have those practices and knowledge and then judge them as if they have. Give people the space to play and fail, I would say is a massive thing. Um, mentors, networks, commissions, um, put people in powerful positions if you really truly wanna do something. Change the culture of your organizations, not just people within it as well. Um, I work with an organization around um, inclusion, about racial inclusion. And they sent me a flyer the other day from their marketing team. There was no representation on it. And I contacted the, the head of the organization. He was shocked. He said, oh, we need to look after, we need to look at our signing off process. And I thought to myself, you don't. The poor marketing person just hasn't been able to own the fact that you're shifting the organization. And that's what needs to happen. It needs to be a whole thing. Um, and I just wanted to share my story to show that sometimes people have a really higgledy piggledy way of getting to where they should be, I suppose. And it's always help along the way. So I always think help as many people as you can create opportunities to network. You know, the Etonians know that the old school tie works. It works. And we need to create our own cultural tie, I think. Um, right. And yeah, that's what I would say. It's, it's been fascinating to hear your story, Safina, um, from, from basically when you were born up until the present day. Um, <laughs> You know, sorry know, about that but I just but, thought it was uh, relevant no no not don't nothing to be sorry about it's fascinating um there was a big conference yesterday the anti-racist Cumbria conference that I think was held at the brewery in Kendall I wasn't there yeah um, that's that's a really good example of a network that's working hard in Cumbria and hopefully this network as well we've touched upon absolutely diversity other aspects of, of discrimination as well on the calls and meetings we've had here and we'll continue to do that Safina let's let and please do read the comments in chat Safina as well Let's stay in oh, contact with you, Safina, and Curious Minds. Um, and I think there's some more there's some more listening and talking that we can do together. Um, don't apologise for telling us your story. It was a really fascinating story, and I know people will have appreciated it as well. So thank, thank you very you, much. Please. Um, and thank you for the invite. My pleasure. And honestly, there, there, there be... also feel free. I think Kate's got my email. Um, but please, if you ever want to just grab a tea or a coffee and go of a zoom and just go can i just chat through something um uh, with you or like that's what i'm here Great. for and um, so please do thank you very much well speaking of networks one of the one of the purposes of this network is to champion great stuff going on in cumbria so for the last five minutes we're going to hear from Anne Anne mm -hmm. waggett not who is part of the great new um adrian's wall 1900 festival which has got its tentacles all over cumbria uh, this year um, there's a great print festival going on at Florence Arts Centre in Egremont. So, Anne, I'll get your slides up and over to you. Lovely. Thanks very much, Tom. I'm not going to switch my video on because um, I'm out and about at the moment. Um, but, yeah, if, if we could have the, the four slides, I should try to rattle through these fairly quickly. Um, so, yeah, this is um, the Hadrian's Wall 1900 print exhibition, which opens tomorrow at Florence Arts Centre, just outside Egremont. Um, and it's a partnership project with Northern Print, which is the NPO printmaking studio in Newcastle, and Linden Print, Vega Brennan's lovely little studio near Carlisle. Um, so this is a wonderful story of developing a new arts partnership across and outside of the region. And it's one of the projects I've been looking after in my freelance capacity. Um, just to backtrack quickly, as an artist and a printmaker myself, I've been a member at Northern Print for a while and was invited to participate in this project earlier in the year. Um, as part of the Hadrian's Wall Festival, they split Hadrian's Wall um, into 60 sections, allocating each one to a different printmaker. And we were each tasked with interpreting our part of the wall in whatever way we wanted, as long as printmaking was the predominant method. 
Um, they then asked me if I'd like to involve some more Cumbrian printmakers to cover the western end of the wall. And I just thought this is a great opportunity to tour the exhibition to Cumbria and create a real coast to coast experience for the artists and the audience. So I approached Vega at Linden Print, um, who was also really pleased to be a partner. Thank you, Vega. Um, and together we brought 13 Cumbrian printmakers to the party. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Tom? Thank you. Um, so there is a staggering variety of work, almost every printmaking method you can think of. Some of them you can see here, even some gorgeous paper making as well. Um, it's quite instructive on the breadth and standard of work you can achieve with print when you see it all together like this. Um, and there's lots of work that really makes you examine it closely and really think about how, the process. You know, how did they do that? Um, everyone's approached their part of the wall with a different tack, resulting in some fascinating storytelling and ideas. And there's definitely a few pieces of work that explore the diversity of the communities around the wall too, um, both historically and today. Um, next slide, please, Tom. So um, in the gallery, you can see here, it is literally a beautiful journey from one end of Hadrian's Wall to the other, from Bonus on Solway in the west, all the way across to South Shields, uh, or in the other direction, if you prefer to walk that way. Um, many of the artists have supplied work for sale as well, so there are some lovely Christmas presents to pick up. And there are audio descriptors attached to some of the work too, so you can listen to the stories on your phone in the gallery if you prefer not to read too much. Um, there's a short video about Northern Print, which gives a bit of context for anyone who isn't a print aficionado. Um, and the exhibition is also available to see online as well um, at the Northern Print website. Um, final slide, please, Tom. Thank you. So it opens tomorrow. Um, it's on until the 18th of December, and that's on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays at Florence Arts Centre. Um, the three images here are by Val Fitzgerald, who's a, a Northeast artist, Jill Davis from Cockermouth, and Misha Skinner from Carlisle. So just a huge thanks to all the artists involved. It was such a lovely show and to Vega and to Rebecca from Northern Print for all their work. I hope some of you can make it. Um, do enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Sorry, my Zoom is playing up. Sorry, there we go. Lovely. Um, Thank I've you just very much. seen a, a comment in the chat from Derek, I think, saying what are the opening times? Just check the Florence website, if you don't mind, for, for opening times. OK, Derek? Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Also, the cafe at Florence does very nice cake, if I remember correctly from last time I was there. And I'm sure that can um, can help you uh, appreciate the prints as well. Thank you very much, Anne, for flying through that in five minutes. Uh, we're almost there. In fact, it's 10.30. Just a reminder, um, Amy, do you want to just do 20 seconds on the deep time call meeting that we're hosting next week? Uh, yes, I have put the link in chat um, and CSEN uh, acting as the host uh, a talk for a talk as part of the deep time project. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but I think it's Pete Udolf Seed Collective, uh, who are going to be some of the members of that are going to be in conversation with Karen Guthrie. Um, yeah, you probably want to look up Deep Time if you've not heard of the project. It's big sort of landmark art for West Cumbria. The talk is probably a good chance to get involved. And if there's any questions, I know we've had people from that network on before and lots of people had lots of good questions about the project. That's the time to get involved because there's a big sort of Q&A section. Um, so it's on our website. It's in the chat um, and it's next Thursday evening, 6 p.m. Thank you, Amy. And if I get organised, I'll get the next podcast out today. It's got some nice stuff with Amy Bateman, who's done the 40 Farms um, book, which is on at Reg Edit as well at the moment. I've spoken to Paul Scott, who's a ceramicist, who's got a fantastic exhibition at Blackwell. Um, it's just opened uh, recently. And also Harriet and Rob Fraser, who've done some really interesting work at Bolton Fell Moss near Longtown. Um, uh, it's a big, big old industrial peat bog, which they've done some really interesting artistic stuff around as well. So I've been speaking to them there too. So uh, that is to look forward to, and that will drop hopefully by the end of today or certainly by Monday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Safina. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for everybody else for your contributions as well. It's just great to see this network still thriving on a Friday morning. Love to see your faces. Have a nice weekend. Stay good, good kite flying, but also <laughs> good, good weather. I think a bit better weather. Um, good kite flying weather, but a bit better weather for this weekend too. So um, enjoy the, the calm as, it, as and when it comes your way. And see you all again next Friday. We're going to hear from Emma McCordon, uh, who is a writer from West Cumbria, who's written a radio play. And we're also going to hear from Stefan um, from Ragged um, uh, Edge. 
Ragged, Ragged Edge. Edge Productions. He's also <laughs> done a, a lovely radio play um, that is about to tour rurally in Cumbria and elsewhere. So we're a bit of a radio thing going on next Friday. So looking forward to that already. Nice to see you all. Thanks, Thanks everybody. See you.